But today's talk is basically going to be an applied talk, kind of big data story time, just about how MailChimp does data science. So if you've been to some extremely technical talks, this is going to stay at a higher level and go across sort of many different things we've done. If you have any deeper questions about how we did any of them, just grab me uh, later after the talk and we'll go through them. Okay, so I'm John. I'm an operations research guy, so my background is in math applied to decision making. And I used to be a analytics consultant for large businesses in the government, so I was very used to large, slow enterprises. And then I showed up at MailChimp, and MailChimp was a startup. Any of y'all use MailChimp in here? Got some MailChimp users, got a few hands, sweet. So we're the largest email service provider in terms of users at this point. We've got about 4 million, 4 million users who send marketing email through us. Uh, and the way it works is that you sign up for an account, you send mail, and then we track opens, we track clicks. If people leave your newsletter and you drop some JavaScript on your site, we can actually track where they go on your site, what they buy, et cetera, throw that back into the application. You can segment on it. So it's sort of advanced, complicated email marketing type stuff. Um, we send about 6 billion, maybe 7 billion emails a month at this point. And we track another couple billion events on top of that, opens, clicks, unsubscribes, abuse reports, et cetera. So we have a lot of data. Uh, in fact, a couple of our domains are in the Alexa 500, both MailChimp as well as our list management tool. Um, and we're all in Atlanta, so we're all in the south. Uh, that's just where we ended up. Okay, so I showed up at MailChimp two years ago, and I met this guy. This is Greg, and he is a graphic designer. And then I met Fabio, who's also a graphic designer and another graphic designer, and another graphic designer, and another graphic designer, and another graphic designer. And this is our apparel designer. Uh, he makes t-shirts like that. And this is the billboard that they designed above the strip club, which our office is behind. So we don't actually work at the strip club. And then we have like action figures for Freddy, our mascot. So I showed up and I just started seeing all this stuff. This is Jason, and he wrote a book on design. This is our head of UX, Aaron, who also wrote a very famous book on design called Designing for Emotion. And I met Ron, who's our art director. He designed the logo for our artificial intelligence model that I built. And I met Ben, who's our CEO, also a designer. And I quickly realized that most companies are not in the business of analytics. You come to conferences like this and you start to think, like everyone is doing analytics all the time. And the world just runs on analytics. And that's sort of how I was thinking, you know, being an analytics consultant. And then I showed up at MailChimp and just quickly realized, wow, the way MailChimp makes money is by having a really, really well-designed, friendly site that people love to use. Nothing to do with analytics. So I felt a bit like I was in Dune meeting the Fremen for the first time. Anyone seen Dune? Don't watch it unless you like David Lynch. And, you know, there's, there's weird people. They're speaking a language I don't understand. They live in the desert. How am I going to interact with them? Quickly, I came to realize the way everyone talked, everything at MailChimp was about improving the product and improving the user experience of that product. So this is how I needed to think, right? And the way that folks did this, uh, this is actually a poster that's up on the wall at work. They listen hard, and they change fast. So change fast. MailChimp releases a new version every three to five weeks. Uh, if you were to ever follow our blog or subscribe to our newsletter, you just constantly get stuff from us saying, hey, we added this feature, we added this feature, we redesigned this to make it easier for y'all. And the way that MailChimp knows what to do, you know, what do we do next, is we stay in constant conversation with our user base. So this is the listen hard part, right? We're constantly interviewing people, flying around the world and talking with folks, setting up cameras and actually you know, sitting over their shoulder and seeing how they use the app. We do this both with our largest paid customers as well as with free users. So uh, it doesn't matter that you're a free user with 300 people on your list. We still want to understand how are you using the app, what do you find challenging. And one of the artifacts of that are these personas that the user experience team created. So they basically created personas that are archetypes of various types of users. So we have Eliza, the PR manager, and Fred, who's kind of like the startup person who loves going through the app and finding all the cool little new stuff. Uh, we have Ada, who's the administrative assistant. A lot of our users are administrative assistants, and we'll get to why Ada's so challenging. 
but essentially Ada has no time because this person has been told, oh, you need to send the company newsletter on top of the million other things that you have to do for your job. So the motivation ex is external to the administrative assistant usually. So this becomes a challenge. We've got agency partners, so we've represented that with Mario, and then we've got our API users or our devs. I, I find it a little insulting that they chose the neck beard to represent the API user, but whatever, he, he looks kind of cool. Okay, so then thinking about these users, what do I do as a data scientist to improve the user experience of MailChimp? What does that look like? Well, you've seen a lot of examples online of how data science is used, and it kind of, it usually looks like this, right? So this is coming into MailChimp, what I had an idea of, of data science being like, which is just kind of paint by numbers data viz. So here we've got, uh, this is a product that was released from a popular restaurant review website. Uh, and basically, you pick a city, you pick a keyword, and all of the cities and keywords are curated. So I can pick San Francisco. Atlanta's not even here, so I find that insulting. But I pick San Francisco, I pick hipster, and it does a heat map and says, oh, hipsters are in the mission. Haha, <laughs> that's funny, because we already knew that. So this doesn't really improve the user experience in any way. This just sort of flexes a little bit of data muscle, right? Sort of shows people, oh, look at the data we have, and you already knew that hipsters were in the mission, and now we showed you with a heat map and our data. Uh, similarly here, this is a professional social network, and I've pulled up my graph here, and I can see, oh, there's me, there's Hillary Mason, we're connected. Hillary Mason exists in some cluster of other people that I'm connected to. Uh, there are some other clusters, and they're generally where I used to work or where I went to college. Is this improving my experience of the social network at all? No. You know, did you have to even display it as a graph? No. What are you doing here? You're, you're flexing some kind of data muscle prior to maybe going public or asking for a round of funding. But this was my understanding of what you did with data science. But, of course, this does nothing to improve the product or the user experience. So then what am I going to do? Well, I wrote down this tic-tac-toe chart of how the data science team was going to operate, which was just me when I started. So this is what I'm going to do. Uh, at this point, we've got a few other data scientists. But for now, this is me. And what I decided was we're going to help internal customers and external customers. So internal customers are other teams. External customers are our users. And we're going to help them by providing insights and capabilities. Insights are just one-off engagements that provide some sort of, you know, report, data set, et cetera. Capabilities are tools. We're going to provide something that people can use on an ongoing basis. And right now, we spend about 20% of our time on insights and 80% on tools. That's just because if you build a capability, you know, people can use it over and over again. It's kind of like teaching a man to fish versus giving them fish or something. So it's, just, it's a lot better to build tools because folks can use them. But we spend about 20% of our time just doing one-off reports, et cetera. Maybe it's a blog post or some kind of guide that we'll put on the website. Um, and so what I want to do in the time I have is just run really quickly through all of these corners of this grid and give you examples. And the idea here is for you all just to walk away and understand kind of like what, is it, what does data science look like in the real world for a small business uh, that's using it that's not really an analytics business. It's something else. So I'm just going to give you examples of from my day-to-day -day life so that you get a feel for it. Okay, uh, this is the support team. This is where they sit. It's actually half of the company. So half of MailChimp engages in email and chat support with our, with our users. We offer that to everyone, even free users. And they all sit in Atlanta. That way we can keep a tight sort of grip on the culture and make sure that everyone kind of engages with users in the same way. But it's become very difficult to schedule these folks. And the way it was taking place is that the support team themselves carved out a few people on support who would maintain the schedule in Excel. And uh, I don't know if you guys can see this, but essentially each person was in a shift. They were on duty for certain times of the day. They could kind of move around their lunch break a little bit. Some people counted as a whole person. And sadly, some people counted as half a person. If they weren't fully trained, they were considered half a person, which is sad for that person. But essentially, they would maintain the schedule and sum it up at the bottom, and this was, they would they'd say, okay, this is how many people we have on point, is what they called it when you were in chat, and this is what our demand is that would come out of a forecast model. Uh, if you weren't on point, you were handling emails. So that was sort of like 
it, that's how you got your sanity back is one day a week everyone would handle email and that was a little bit lighter than actually being on the front handling chat. That's very difficult. Um, but what we realized is two people doing this out of support is really not the best use of their time. What is the best use of everyone's time? It's for me to build an optimization model that can actually do this. So I can actually write all this up as a linear program. And rather than type it in LaTeX for this presentation, I wrote it on a piece of paper and took a photo of it, because uh, that was quicker for me. And basically, we can represent the entire decision space as a polytope and end space, and then find uh, a point along the boundary that actually is the optimal point for minimizing shortages of people in relation to demand. So this can be represented mathematically. We coded it up in a format called .lp, which is disgusting. It's just a bunch of inequalities. Um, and you can throw that at a solver, and out pops a schedule. And so this is what it looks like. It says, all right, here's when you're on email. Everything gets to be on email once a week. Uh, you got to be on point if you're not on email. And it actually schedules their lunch breaks and tries to minimize shortages of chat support people. So it's just a one-off engagement. And something that I've come to learn is to keep this idea of Kobayashi Maru in mind. Does everyone know what this is? Have you seen Star Trek? Essentially, Kirk uh, is in training, and there's this, this test you have to go through that's unbeatable, and they're just looking to see how you respond in the face of an unwinnable situation. And he decides to actually just change the rules of the game. So he kind of like hacks into the system and changes and, and allows him to win. But I think as data scientists, it's important to keep in mind if a model is not working, you can always question whether you as a business should be engaging in this particular practice, right? So in the case of chat support, we had this issue around 10.30 every day where, so these people in blue were sort of the first shift. They were already on duty, but they, they're the 6 a.m. shift. They were kind of taking their lunch break right around then, and then you didn't have a lot of other shifts on duty yet. And so there was always this hole because actually around 10.30 there was a huge amount of demand. And so the model would always, you know, it would optimize the model, but right there, there would often be a shortage of folks. And so one thing we have to realize is, okay, you've built a model. It solves the problem as best as it can. You still need to ask the question, do we even need to have the shifts like this? And does 1030 really have to be a lunch break option? Can I remove that and make it 1130 instead? And so these are things you can bring to uh, management. And the good thing about building a model is now you can quantify those changes, right? So you can say, hey, maybe we should change the way business is being done. And if we do, my model now tells me, you know, this will happen. We'll get rid of this shortage. So that's something just to keep in mind when you build these models is just because you've optimized the problem doesn't mean you can't do better by just stopping what you're doing and doing something else. Okay. External insights. Real quick. I want to get to tools. Uh, we do a lot of research for our users and actually publish that research on our blog or in various reports and just say, hey, just so you know, uh, you may want to engage with email <coughs> marketing in this particular way based on you know, whatever set of circumstances. So I'll give you some examples of research we've done for our external users. And the cool thing about us is we have so many users and so much data uh, we send to billions of unique email addresses every month we can actually answer questions no one else can. Uh, one of those questions that we kept getting was, hey, this is my inbox here. Gmail introduced the new promotion <coughs> promotions tab. What does that mean for engagement? Uh, if you send email marketing, this was kind of scary, right? Because you had everything going into the primary tab if it wasn't going into the spam folder. And then all of a sudden, Gmail relegates it to this other tab. And similarly on their app now, when you log into the Gmail app, you'll actually see a little bar that says, oh, you've got promotional email. and roll it up into like a single bar. So what does this mean for engagement? Well, we can actually go into the data and figure it out, right? So we can go into our systems that store basically every record of sends, opens, clicks, et cetera, to Gmail and see what's going on. So. What we, <coughs> what we have here, sorry, I'm fighting a cold. What we have here is three weeks prior and three weeks after Gmail introduced the promotions tab. And we're looking at open rates. So across all Gmail, average open rate. Uh, weekday in blue, weekend in yellow. And what we see is that a raw, there's a raw 1% decrease in engagement, or about 10% you know, or so uh, decrease uh, relative. So this is not good but at least it quantifies it for users, right? This is kind of what you should expect to see. And so people um, can be a little bit depressed, but at the same time, 
they're not going to think that everything is just going to die, right? Like you're going to get a 50% decrease. No, we've actually kind of looked at, eh, it looks like it's on average about 10%. Similarly, during the government shutdown, we had a bunch of users who actually send to government email addresses. You know, what should they expect in terms of disengagement during the government shutdown because these employees can't check their email anymore? In fact, they were barred by law from checking their email. So for some government agencies like the top, Security and Exchange Commission, these folks were all essential personnel. So in fact, their engagement with email went up during the government shutdown because the government shutdown occurred during the ramp up of the fall season. So there was actually just an increase in volume and they continued to engage with it. You can actually compare that against something like SBA or the EPA or HUD. Those agencies, their engagement just fell off a cliff, right? So if you happen to have a blog that talked about FHA mortgage policy and you had a lot of HUD readers, you should just know it's not your fault. They literally can't check their email. Um, so we could just put this out there and people could see it and understand, okay, this is what's going on. So a lot of that's, you know, just really fun. One thing we can do is actually educate users on how to engage better with email. Uh, so one, we actually have all these, um, because a lot of people who use our site are marketers and they come from the direct mail world and things like that. There's a lot, they, they believe in a lot of weird black magic things that maybe aren't true. Um, one thing that we started hearing after 2012 was that you should send email all the time because the Obama campaign sent email all the time. Um, and if you've followed the news around how the Obama campaign conducted themselves, this is true. Obama didn't actually send the email himself, but the Obama campaign sent a bunch of email during the campaign and in fact raised more money via email marketing than any other channel. Right? I think there was a point at which they were sending like a couple or three a day. And they had done a lot of testing around how to do this. So they, they did a lot of A-B testing, figured out, okay, You've donated $25 in the past. I need to send you an email asking for 50 bucks, understanding that you're not going to give me $50. You're going to give me another 25 to add up to 50. And so they did all these tests and figured out exactly how to ask for money. And it was amazing. The amount of money they earned from email versus Romney, it's just night and day. So people saw this and said, wow, I need to send all the time too because Obama did it and it totally worked for them. The problem is, is that... Papa John's is not the Obama campaign, right? So the Obama campaign had a drop dead date. People were highly engaged. People wanted to give money to this thing. Papa John's exists in a steady state, right? They're always selling pizza. There is no sense of like, you need to buy this pizza before November 2012 or else what? It's still going to be there with like the crappy banana pepper in the corner after November 2012. So there is no sense of send more right now. And in fact, we can go into the data. So this is a particular user. Um, we can look at all of our users who have ever engaged in different send frequencies, and we can see if you change your frequency, sure enough, in every case where there's a statistically significant relationship, uh, engagement falls off as you send more, right? So in this particular case, when they started to get around um, once every three days, we would see, you know, okay, engagement sort of got cut in half. Here's another user, just starts to fall off as you send more. And people would say in response to this, well, that's fine. Sure, every email is going to have less engagement, but over a period, I'm actually going to get in aggregate more engagement. And that's all I care about. And when you hear that argument, I, I immediately started to think, well, this is like revenue management in hotels, right? Oh, I should decrease my prices. That's going to give me more demand. And in aggregate, I'm going to get more revenue. Well, the way those relationships work, so if we actually were to model this with some kind of linear model and then multiply through by send frequency, you get a quadratic, which you can actually optimize for frequency, right? So in this particular case, we've got total monthly clicks versus sends per month. This was for this user. Um, so you can actually see that in aggregate versus send frequency, this quadratic relationship, you can optimize it and find, okay, for this user, there actually is a point where sending more gives you less total clicks. And it turns out for them, it's they, the max is actually once every other day. So we can do this kind of stuff for, for users and, and educate them on, hey, you're right to a point. You should send more frequently if you're sending like once a month. But then you're going to reach a point where you have way diminishing returns and you should stop there. So we were able to bring analytics from revenue management to bear on this problem. So that's really cool. OK, capabilities. This is where things get fun. So when I was hired at MailChimp, the first tool I got to build was a weapon. Um, and so it's kind of like the Defense Department where they build really cool stuff and then it trickles down into other fun things for good people. So you build GPS for 
the military, and then eventually we all have GPS in our phones. That's how things have worked at MailChimp. My first engagement was building a weapon to stop bad people. It ended up really helping good people, and all the tools since then have helped good people. So the first tool I had to build was for the, the compliance team. And the way this works is at an ESP, when you sign up, there's a compliance team that needs to vet you because we send 7 billion, 6 billion emails a month. We have a lot of users. We don't have 4 million IP addresses, so users have to share IP addresses. You can pay us for a, d a dedicated IP if you're a large enough customer. You probably don't want to do that anyway because there's some, some nice effects that come out of pooling your reputation with other senders uh, because you might send in bursty ways. You kind of want people to be standing in some sending in some steady stream, so it's kind of nice to share that IP address. But if you share it and a bad actor gets in there, they can poison the well, right? And by poison the well, I mean Gmail could block us, Hotmail could block us, if they send something really terrible. So what we, what we had was a team in place that would vet users and say, okay, you can't enter and send through us because of what you're doing. And unfortunately, the compliance team started to look a lot like this telephone pole where a user would get through and do something terrible, and we'd paper another rule on top of the telephone pole saying, hey, okay, you can't do this now, right? And so when I entered into MailChimp, I ended up doing an audit of all the ways you could enter the compliance queue, and there were just scads of them, and then various things would happen in the queue that would either get you re-enabled or disabled permanently. Um, and one of the frightening things was that the compliance team ended up having to scale linearly with the size of our user base. So you'd have a small compliance team when we had maybe 80,000 users. Then we introduced the free plan, the forever free plan, and we started exploding. Do you really want to grow this cost center in a linear fashion with, this, with the size of your user base? That's kind of frightening. So what are we going to do? Well, I looked at some of the reasons why people were getting shut down. On one side, you had people like this, high hard bounce rate. So these are people who are sending to invalid inboxes. This is really bad. You don't send to inboxes that are invalid because that means you did not have permission to send to them. Uh, high unsub rate. So people would receive the email and say, this is bullshit, I don't want this. You also had people who were shut down because they uploaded a large list or they asked to buy an expensive account or they requested high volume approval. So these are people who just wanted to pay us money. Right? They just wanted to give us lots of money, and we got freaked out and shut them down and said, hey, we need to vet you first, because we were scared. Why in the world do you need to send two million emails? Well, that's, uh, that's understandable, but people come to web services these days with an expectation of speed, right? I can sign up, I can pay, and I can do things immediately. And because of that, we started to get a lot of anger. So these are quotes from people who left because they were stuck in the compliance queue. Account review takes too much time. My needs is gone. Stop reviewing accounts every time they make a change. We paid for you for a service. Your service is too restrictive. Bullshit review process. I'm sending out high press releases about this time-wasting process. Google me and you would know that I am a serious marketer with influence. I'll definitely make sure everyone I know in this industry knows what a pain in the ass this was. And this person could be good. This person could be bad. I don't know their story. I just saw the quote. But what I realized was th this doesn't need to happen, right? What we care about are permission, that you have permission to send to this list, and that the list is hygienic, meaning not only do you have permission to send to these people, but that the permission is recent, that you didn't get permission 10 years ago when you, they all dropped their business cards into a fishbowl, and now you're finally getting around to send to these email addresses, and lo and behold, they're all like MindSpring, Earthlink, and AOL. You know, that's not hygienic permission, and in fact, you could say that the permission has expired at some fuzzy point between 10 years ago and now. So how are we going to predict these things? Well, there are a couple things we look at. Your purchase correlation, so this isn't even a prediction. We actually just go on the black market and buy every stolen uh, gray market purchase co-registration type list we can find, uh, and we load them into our system and check against them. So we load all of this into Redis so it can be extremely fast, but we just check, okay, what list are you on? You're on the Sony hack list? Well, that sucks. So we can actually just say, okay, 70% of your list is scrape Facebook emails, shut you down. Um, hard bounce rate, on the other hand, how many of your email addresses are dead? If we send to them, we're going to get a bounce back saying, oh, this is an invalid email address. This doesn't exist. That rate is actually exactly what we're going after. That's what the ISPs look at. So we built a large AI model that can actually predict that. I'm not going to go through this, but ask me questions about it later if you have them. Essentially, we've got user metadata. We've got data about their list. So every email address on a list, uh, chances are we've seen most of those before. 
MailChimp sends to email to so many people all across the globe that someone has probably sent to that address before unless it's brand spanking new. So for most of your list, we can actually say, okay, what are they engaging with in the past? Where are they located? What are they interested in? Or have they had hard bounce in the past? We can roll all that up. We can send it through an intermediate model at a single address level and then roll up all of those scores into like a cumulative distribution function that's for the, the user list level. Uh, campaign data, all your tokens, et cetera, we can even evaluate that, roll that up in a single row, send all of that through a final model and actually predict, is this user good, is this user bad? And the way we design this, if we go back to thinking about caring about the user experience and caring about you know, how people use the product, I don't care that I use the newest and best tools, right? All I want to do is create something stable and I want to get it out there fast because I wanted to improve the experience of the product. So we chose tools that did that, right? That eliminated risk, eliminated complexity, and got the job done, because that's all I care about. So for our slow storage, we went after sharded Postgres. It totally worked for us because a lot of our data, especially around address historical data, is all structured. So there was really no reason to use a NoSQL database. Uh, just doing a sharded Postgres setup that's massive totally work for us. Fast storage is in Redis because we can save all sorts of interesting data structures in there and it's in RAM so we can act, we actually have one dossier per email address in Redis and we'll just pull them out when someone signs up. Hey, who's on your list? This person, this person, this person. Oh look, all these people are on this shitty list from the past. Well, let's shut you down. Uh, the modeling language we used is R because it's got a great community behind it. Um, it's sort of by default one of the data science languages you might pick. Machine learning, uh, we actually use random forest because it's hard to overtrain it. It's really easy to go in and investigate what's going on in it. It gives you variable importance type information. It actually worked better than almost every other model we could have picked except for boosted trees. It was the only one that came close. Um, so we just, we were very conservative. It kind of looked like a 1950s family of technologies is what we picked. And it turns out, now that we have this model in place, 70% plus of our compliance tickets are automatable. They don't actually have to go to a human anymore. So now our compliance team can scale in a more appropriate way. In fact, now our compliance team can be focused on the really bad actors, right? Because a lot of the people they're shutting down are not like um, what I'd call adversarial spammers that are trying to change their behavior to get around all of our blocks. A lot of the people they're shutting down are, are just people who don't know better. If you come from the direct mail marketing world, you don't need permission to mail stuff to people. You can just do it. In email, you need permission, so they might come in, not know that, go steal a list from the local chamber of commerce and start sending ads for their new real estate business, right? That's, that's more stupid than it is malicious. Those people this model can now handle, so that's just really exciting. But now that we've built that internal capability, you've gotten all the technologies in, the pla in place, this is where we can now start to help all the good users, which is what I think is just a lot of fun. So some examples of how we can use all of this new storage to help good users. Things like send time optimization, right? If I'm tracking all this history about every email address I've ever seen, I know when does an email address receive mail from everybody at a global level, and when are they engaging? When are they opening? When are they clicking? And based on that, I can say, oh, look, you know, here it's time slot eight. This is a place where they're engaging with email. They're in their inbox. They're clicking things, and the sends are not there. So the sends came from some other time slot during the day. So this implies they had time. Now they've gone back into their inbox, and they're actually checking their mail. That would be a great time to maybe have your email in there just a few minutes before that so it's at the top of the inbox so people will see it and want to engage with it. So we can actually provide this data to users now and uh, even if, if you haven't sent through us before, you sign up for us, you pay for the service, we can actually give you this intelligence immediately. So that's pretty cool. We can append demographic data to email addresses. So let's say you log in and you bring a list that's got nothing on it except the email addresses so you don't have any merge tag data. Chances are someone in the system somewhere else has, has already seen this email address. Maybe they have a first name associated with it on their list. We could use that first name to give back gender, even if that first name is a misspelling or fake. So um, the model we built can say Verancia, probably a misspelling of Veronica, but still the model says, hey, that's female. From what we've seen, that's associated with females. Hitman, Hitman is not a real first name. The model still knows this is, like, I think it's predominantly like 80% 80, 80 guys that put down Hitman as their first name, it's stupid. Um, 
we can also use tokens from the email address, right? So uh, this isn't this doesn't really go into the graph so much, but we can still look at oh, do you have GRL in your email address? If you do, you tend to be female. Do you have HN period in your email address? That tends to be the end of John and then dot before your last name. In fact, that's my name in Gmail. Um, that tends to be male. So we can look at all those trigrams. A fun one is MOH tends to be highly male because it's generally associated with Muhammad, and there aren't a lot of female analogs to that. Uh, so our models can look at that. The other thing they can do is go into the global store of subscription data and say, hey, what else are you subscribed to? Two of our senders are Trunk Club and Stitch Fix. Any Trunk Club users, Stitch Fix users here? Anybody? Anybody? Oh, one hand. Um, so I like Trunk Club. Basically, they send me a box of clothes, and I just try on stuff and say, I like this, and I send back the rest so I don't have to shop, which is nice because I have three kids, and it's really annoying to shop. Um, but we can use that subscription data. Stitch Fix is generally for ladies. Trunk Club is generally for men. We can use that to predict demographic data as well. So that's just an example of gender. But we can do a lot of this with this huge data store that we've created for other reasons. So then going back to these personas and thinking about them. So let's think about Ada. How do I actually turn these things into products? Because it's one thing to talk about, oh, <coughs> we can do this data science stuff. It's another thing to think about, how do I expose it to an end user? Uh, this is something that data scientists generally don't think about is, oh, I could do this really awesome thing. But then when I think about our users, it's, how in the world am I going to do this stuff on some the graph of subscription data in a way that Ada can use it? Um, you look out there in the world, it's like, oh, yeah, friend suggestion. That's a natural, right? You just suggest friends. Some of these products that we're building, not so natural. And what I came to realize was just, if I go back to this tic-tac-toe thing, right, the re this is the hardest corner. Building capabilities for external users is the hardest corner of what I do because Technically, it's hard to build tools versus just doing one-off insights. And then you have to communicate that tool to the user when the user is not engaged with MailChimp all the time. When I build tools for our internal teams, it's great because they eat, breathe, sleep MailChimp. But our users don't. A lot of them want to get in and get out so they can go back to whatever else they need to do. So then how do I build a tool for this person? One thing that Aaron, our head of UX, likes to say is that a, a product is only as powerful as it is easy to use. He's a designer, so it's easy for him to say this. This is a huge challenge for data science people, right? So I'm going to give you an example of how we've done this. Um, this is discovered segments. So the way this works is all the email addresses in our system, we've stored them as a graph. <coughs> and that graph is based on subscription data. So I'm subscribed to my local pool newsletter. I'm subscribed to a local microbrewery, et cetera. And then the people close to me are going to be subscribed to stuff I'm also subscribed to in some way. And so the way Discovered Segments works is I go into my list, and maybe it's got a couple million people on it. Our bigger users don't know everyone personally, right? But maybe I know a few people I want to target. So these are all uh, people who are really into judo, let's say. How do I find everyone else on my list who might also be into judo? Well, I give it the people I know about, and it goes into the graph, and it does a slightly modified cosine similarity calculation where it also cares about list size and things like that, but essentially finds the people that live in the neighborhood of the segment you provided. And that's why it's called discovered segments. You give it a little seed, and it grows that into a full segment. Now, how am I going to expose this to the user? Here's an example from MailChimp's list. We have a list of 4 million people. Most of them are our users. Some of them are like our competitors signed up for a newsletter just so they know about new features and stuff like that. But I grabbed some uh, tech journalists. So I've got Ars Technica, Read, Write, Web, all things D, et cetera. And I've just pasted them into, I've, I've blurred out their names, but pasted them into the Discovered Segments box here. And the entire feature is now a button. Right, so I did all this work on storing a graph and doing these amazing computations. How does it enter into the application? It's just a button, because that's all it needs to be, right? I, I provide a seed of email addresses, and I get back a segment, and I save it. There's no reason necessarily to show a graph like this. A graph like this exists. Wouldn't it be cool if I showed where they existed, and then here are the people who are just as close to those people as they are to each other, and that'd be awesome. It doesn't matter, right? So this, this is what makes the cut. Uh, if I'm improving the experience for the user, all I need is a button. And so some examples of this in action. Uh, one of them is for me. 
we wanted to send out a newsletter saying, hey, we've got a new product called Mandrill that sends transactional email. Uh, transactional email would be like password reset emails, receipts, etc. Who uses this? It's people who build apps, right? So Ada does not build apps. Ada does not need to know about Mandrill. But uh, Andre, the API user, the developer type, that's the persona that needs to know about Mandrill. How am I going to target those people, right? Well, I'm going to grab some that I know about. Um, so maybe it's people who subscribe to Hacker Newsletter, you know, because the guy who works for Hacker Newsletter actually works for us. Or so I can just say, hey, you know, do you know people who, who are developers? Maybe grab a few email addresses, throw them at discovered segments, and say, who all on our list actually is a developer? And then I can send an email out to those people and say, hey, just so you know, Mandrill. You already know all the stuff about Mailchimp. We email you once a week. Now I want to tell you about Mandrill. And this newsletter actually did twice as well as our normal ones uh, because we didn't send it to everybody. We targeted the exact people who'd be interested in it and sent it to them. So I'm not, I'm not using dis Discovered Segments doesn't give you email addresses you've never seen before. It gives you back email addresses on your list, but it says these are the people who will be engaged with what you're trying to say. Another example of it, uh, this is from a retailer who sends through us. They used a lot of our uh, unsupervised clustering stuff to... Uh, find segments who'd be interested in various kinds of products. Uh, in this particular one, I forget what they were targeting exactly, but it was somehow related to this dress. And they actually got a 200% uplift in revenue just by making sure they targeted the right group of people for that. So, totally works. So going back to this concept of the graph, I'm just going to give you another example of how we've stripped this down and exposed it to users. Okay, we got this graph. This one is actually for one user. So this is for Joyous. Uh, who's a retailer. This is 200,000 email addresses from their list. And I've, I've graphed them based on their mutual subscriptions. And I can actually find clusters, right? So I can find communities. This uses modularity maximization. So based on their other subscriptions. So here I've got a bunch of joyous subscribers. And look at what they're into. All the other stuff they subscribe to is fashion related. Similarly here, we've got a bunch of tea party newsletters and volumizing shampoo. So these are the people I live with in Atlanta. Um, on the flip side, we've got crunchy people. We've got supplements, world peace, yoga, et cetera. These are on the same list, right? So these, this is the other stuff they subscribe to. So now I can start to think about how do I engage with them differently? But how am I going to expose this to the user? I don't know if you all can see this from back there, but the graph is completely unnecessary. Cute, but unnecessary. So how do we actually expose this? This is for Hacker Newsletter, ran their uh, letter through the clustering algorithm, and out pops. Here we have a cluster of subscribers to Hacker Newsletter. What are they interested in? HTML5, JavaScript Weekly, et cetera. These are front-end devs. And you can just see that looking at these thumbnails. You don't need to see a graph, even though it's a graph-based computation. We get to show, hey, I'm going to rank all the stuff that they're interested in for this particular cluster of 1,000, like 1,600 people. You can save that off as a segment if you ever want to target front-end devs. So where are we headed? Uh, i got just a couple minutes left. My goal as a data scientist, and now we've got a small team, so the data science team at MailChimp, is to make data more valuable inside of the product than outside, right? When users come into the system, I want to enrich their data so that they'll stay. Uh, data science can be used in part as a retention technique. Essentially, why would you ever want to leave when we're able to do so many interesting things with your data around discovering segments, appending data? Why would you ever go anywhere else? Uh, one of the cool things is that because we have so many small users from their, these free accounts, we've got data nobody else has who just focuses on the top dollar clients. And some things I want to leave you with, um, going back to this idea of how do you practice data science at a company that's not just doing analytics. My primary goal every day is just to align myself with the goals of the organization and serve the other teams, serve the customer. So if another team is doing something that requires data and they can't do it as well as my team could, uh, if they want me to help out, I can get in there and do some data science to make their lives better. My product should receive no special treatment. Uh, this is something I had to learn the hard way. Just because someone is using Photoshop to do something and I'm using data science to do something, if by changing a button from red to blue has a better effect than some weird model that I built, if that works better, go with that. Just because you use data science doesn't, I mean, unless you're trying to attract investment or something, just because something uses some sort of data science magic does not mean it should live. If it sucks, you can kill it. Always get a goal before you start buying toys. Um, 
a lot of recently people have been saying, oh, you got to do big data, data science, whatever, it's really hot. And what's the easiest way to show your boss that you're making progress? Buy something, hire some consultants, and then you can actually point to them and look at all the money we paid. We're obviously doing something. You'll get fired like a year later, but until then, things are going quite well. Um, I think it's always best to have a goal. We want to build this predictive model to go after hard bounce rates. In order to do that, this is the kind of data we need. In order to store that data, well, it's structured. Let's just go short of Postgres. That's going to be reliable. It's going to be easy. So getting a goal first helps you figure out exactly what tools you're going to need. And avoid complexity. Um, I don't like to think about being hit by a bus, but if I were to be hit by a bus, I want to make sure that my models can go on living. And that can't happen when I'm going after like publishing academic research, right? If you work for a company and you're a data scientist for a company, the goal is to not just be some rock star and to publish, et cetera. The goal is to make stuff people will use, stuff that's practical. And part of that is knowing when to edit. When, you know, oh, wow, this is really cool, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to break. I'm going to have to retrain it constantly. You know, if you have to babysit something constantly because it's super brittle, maybe you don't build it that way. Okay, so those are just four things I wanted to leave you with. One last note in the few last seconds I have. I have a book coming out, which I'm going to shill like crazy right now. It's called Data Smart. If, if you or anyone you love works a lot in spreadsheets and wants to understand how data science algorithms actually work, this book basically takes you through, hey, you want to build a random forest and a spreadsheet step by step so you can learn how it works? Just, I'll take you through it. And so there's a bunch of examples for, of all sorts of different data science problems, like the graph-based ones we just looked at, finding communities in the graph. I do that in a spreadsheet. So not sexy, terribly practical, very informative. Anyway, thank you very much.